Then somewhere they don't ever say nothing about you. And always, see when I played last Friday, I mean uh, on the 26th, there over in Houston, I got in there. I was supposed to be there at 2 p.m. was just when I left there that morning. The plane was late and held up so long. Uh, the I don't know what caused it. Sometime I said my own self is too done me a plane in this one. <laughs> it was about bad. I said, and people about the thousand. You get wild waiting for them planes. But I got in there oh about twenty five minutes before two o'clock. But they made me there at the airport <clears throat> and I was supposed to be number one, you know. Come out uh, on the stage but since I didn't make number one in the time passing too, you know, so they just put that Milton Lock in the guy on and I played second. And I told him, oh, uh, yeah, I didn't get to play much because I wanted to play. And I ain't there. I always play. I ain't never play nowhere. That they don't always stop me, you know, because I played all the time, all the time. Look like when Tom Meter quit, that's when I just be ready <laughs> playing my junk. That's what I always say, playing my junk. I never was a uh, casino piano player. When did you start playing? 29. That's what I was trying to find. They got, they sent me every record I made, every label I made. God, no, I got it in there. I just didn't take time to look for it good. I had the other day looking at it. And all of the OK, Columbia, Paramount. Well, now see, when, in back in, that was in the 20s, in 20, 1929, that's when me and a boy, blind boy named North Mac Henry, was sent to Chicago. Line, and we, when the sent to Chicago, we stayed at 4445 Cashmere Street in a big old flat downstairs. It, had, it was downstairs and named one and, and another <coughs> story high. We stayed there that night and, and we walked around. We didn't get too far out of socket and pound down that place. I didn't fool in playing nothing but noise. And I said, so we went upstairs reckon and got up there and most piano. We looked and listened and played them guys. We went on the bed so they picked us up next day and sent us to the Hotel Vincent Hotel on 36th and Vincent Street in Chicago, Illinois. So that day they picked us out of there to take us to this line. Healy Bill, L-Y-O-N, Lion Healy Bill, H-E-L. Why, <clears throat> that's why we record that. It's a old white fellow, gray head. They call him Mr. Morris, M-E-R-S-H. Now this blind boy, North Mac Henry, during my time when I was washing dishes, working at coffee, that's done pass up to when I was was, uh, you know, walking, carrying packages. When I was walking, carrying packages, that horse and buggy days, and they used to herd cattle in through Dallas, out of the north end of Dallas. Cattle, sheep too. That's a uh, Armstrong packing company, which is it was in South Dallas on Lamar. And so finally one day, my boss, man, Mr. W. R. McCauley, Richard McCauley, and his uncle W. C. Connor. They ran that grocery store on Rawson Hall. Well, I lived on Hall Street, just a block from that store. And they brought me a horse out of that one of them drove horses coming through. And that made me have a horse. <laughs> and uh, then another time, he come, they brought some horse, he bought me another horse out of the old deck, a damn old gray, of high-stepping fiery devil. That first horse they had was a ginger, little old, sore mustang. Then they finally 
got me another horse, but I don't think they got Jim out of that bunch, but the old nub tail headed back off. Well, I had me three horses. Well, the business boss man got in with a laundry business company, and I had me a, a wagon then with a top on to the little grocery. Well, when I worked at grocery store about two years, and they wouldn't be paying me oh, a little less than that, give me nine dollars, no, seven dollars a week. Then I got to raise the nine dollars a week. Well, I, while I was working for them, and they got in church with my folks and all that, but at the same time, my grandma and grandpa and them had worked for some white people. But lawyer Edward A. Bell Sterling, he was civil attorney in law. And so from a kid like, see, when my mama was working for them and grandpa and them, see, they had a seven, had a row of seven room rent houses. And my grandma and grandpa collected that down seven, five cents a week from them houses for a bell selling them. Then when grandma and grandpa, and also bell selling them had given my grandpa and grandma in that big six room house at the end of that seven row house, live long as day they live. Well, they did. They died till the day they died. And when they died, my mother taking over, and she was married then. Now, right now, I don't know, I don't know my sister, all of them, I'm just, I have it on average. Nobody living, but just a few of us now. I got a son, he's 21 years old. He's in, he might the first sergeant in the Marine. <laughs> yeah, I got it. Alexander Moore Jr., he's 21, he's not the first sergeant in the Marine, he's in North Carolina now, Jacksonville. But he went to school, I always told him, you had to come up like your daddy, you stay out of trouble. They were getting them jail bars and things, I look and see you, I'm going to do that and keep walking. And you go to school so he can make it. So when he finished his elementary schools, and and went into college, even went through North Texas State University playing football. Well, I didn't never like football, but I, not him playing, I liked it all right. And, but in the same time, I was going by it, but I just look at it. So after he played it, <laughs> and, and he would explain to me about it, but I liked it more after he got out of it, because I don't want to be there, he broke his neck, and you know, all that. Kind of stuff, I don't like it. But I wouldn't ever tell him I did. I'd discourage him. See, that's like people don't realize that. I read the children, some of them don't make it right. And people, you don't want them to do this and don't want them to do that. But if he's if he just going to do that alone, let him make out, let him come out of it. See, that's right, that's right. Just let him go on through it and make the better. If he comes out all right, then you got to. Boys can say, well, I what didn't want you to do in the first place. Then if, if, if he would tell me, why didn't you tell me? Well, I didn't want to discourage you. Because you never know what guy like. Look here. Here in the last years, I've never seen so many people writing left hand. <laughs> Look here. I laugh about it. And, and some old people try to stop them. You don't do that. If he don't write left hand, let him write left hand. Yeah, these nigga pinmen that make that stuff. That's what I'm talking about. Me, you see my hand rights and things? That's what you tell all the time. I didn't write so good, you just come out of school and sit great. I tell them, well, my papa was a pinman. And the people don't know you might have hold a pinman. I never seen so many. Look. <laughs> but now I say, that's the reason I'm telling you the truth. Back down in my days, in them 1905, 4, 6, 7, 8, come up school age, I seen books to show you how to write, you know, penmanship. And that's the correct way to hold them. Correct. But the, they don't teach, it's a lot they don't teach the day teachers when I went to school. Hell no. Let me show you. When I went to school, now maybe you went to number four school, even to number six. 
of whatever school that I went to, number four. Well, now my school, your grade, you in the sixth, I'm in the sixth, uh, he's seven or nine, but whatever. we have spelling matches. It matches in grades. You see how good that rate? Right now, every day these people come out here, you see why these students don't know darn thing. They're dreading in the pain, which a lot of them don't. Well, that's seven, eight, ten, ten, some in college, can't even all spell your name. That's the truth, man. Don't know one street from another. Yeah. Like I can see, you take, you take like, now nobody didn't learn me nothing about Roman letters. See, from it. Such as I, I, V, four, five, six, and all that stuff. X ten. I learned that my own self. I could, uh, one thing I do kind of regret about my life then now I was studying that individual with myself, being a postman. You know, I, was, you know, I could have been. I regret that one thing. I could have been. A, I like been in postal service. See, oh, you make good money, get a job, and baby. That's the only one thing on the average I regret, because. I was a heck of a boy. When I was 15 years old, I was a good man than man in my age and size. Yeah. 15 years old, I still said to the world, I was all the man I was ever going to be. Because, like I told you, I'm back there while I go, I done this kind of work. Man, this dude trucking his freight out, trucking his cotton gems, sniping on railroads, mules and teen and horses and all that kind of stuff. Well, I got away from that. Now, when I was about five and four years old, I just do remember. Why do I remember when I was in El Paso, Texas? That's where my papa went there to make candy. He got a job for somebody, you know, get on the line, but then I, we went to, he taking us kids. There was, I had another brother and a sister, three of us kids, but I was the oldest. And he came to El Paso, Texas, and uh, stayed there. And the to make a story, he kept us there till around six, in between six and seven. And my brother and I sent us back. My brother wasn't yet younger than me. Put us on together and put us on a train. Pulled my service, t- seen to us getting off in Dallas. And then my, my grandma and my grandma and it. Met us at the station, bring us home. We stayed our grand, but in that same six room house, six room house, I tell you about. The time for us to go to school in seventh grade. I mean, you know, we're seven years old. So, well, why we didn't ever feel the because we all think about that. Came one night and my sister, <laughs> we, we, Mama was working too. Papa was working, but. And we stayed locked up, and you could see them Mexicans, and we stayed in them Dolby houses. <laughs> you know, made out of that cement and sand. And they had a streetcar. We stayed on Cleveland Street. I studied good here not long ago, but just not long ago, but a lot of times. I don't hear I remember that, but that's the damn name of that street. We stayed on in El Paso, Texas, Cleveland. And the streetcar just went around, went <laughs> around in that. And so we'd get out in the street time and put bricks and rocks on it. See, Mama gonna be on that car when it come around. Well, John, then my sister, we went in that Mexican store and the weenies, you know, they had weenies, but they'd be linked together. <laughs> she called up, she was gonna get a weenie. I never, I laughed about that now, I tell my wife about it. And when she started running out that door, that went weenie. <laughs> Well, these dragons, we laughing like a dog. <laughs> and I don't know how come that man would let her get that far. And um, he finally come out there saying something. Well, we didn't live too far. We run in that alley. And he got in the house. And, and that door, that guy come out and look in the window. And he's pointing and said, baby, this is saying something. Well, I don't know what he's saying. And I we come to school, tell get dad and I got to go to school around eight, eight years old. That's when that dad had a big 1980 flood head, dad said. Man, and a lot of people look at me funny, like, 
Exactly, I don't know what I'm talking about. They just I said, sure did. I said, you stand in town and look west. All these, you could hardly see nothing but maybe a top of the, that the smokestack on high. Just like, just like that. You see mattresses, cows, hogs float. And in front you floating, going. So, no, oh, we on that trench river flood. Okay. That was all said and done. So, 1913, that's when the Paved Hall Street, I think. Well, I done got up in my 15, 16 years old. Now, you think it's a lie. I got all, see, let me tell you, all I be talking about, I got papers to show it. And they might be in that stack laying right there. I was on my horse wagon one day on a delivery. And that's when they was inducting them in the army. <laughs> World War One. I'm 16 years old now. And I drove my way, I see them inducting a big long line, you know, and they ain't getting them ready for the army. Oh, she key. I jumped off my wagon and, and put the weight on my arm, I get in that line. <laughs> I, I laugh. When I share a lot of these guys about me being in the army and, and got an honorable discharge and never did put on a suit. That's right, honorable suit. And, uh, but okay, when they, I, I, I was staying low, you know, in that line. I don't know what the hell I'm, I was doing that then. What the heck was I stupid and staying low with, but okay, when they get to you and him, then maybe I'm behind you. What's your name, boy? That's just how they're taking me. What's your name? I said, Ellen, I don't know. What's your father's name? Yes, boy. What's your father's name? Blue the mother. How old are you? <laughs> 21. <laughs> Don't lie that quick, boy. What's your age, boy? Now, that's what I'm trying to see. Now, after all of this, I'm still working at the grocery store. Still working at the grocery store. I was in December, I mean, in October, somewhere along there. I was going to find them people. I've been out there just a bad time some of these I'll get them people. I'll even show you all that what I'm talking about. So, now where, when it comes to sending out questionnaires, I mean, even living at the same place, I didn't get mine. Three or four months out when I was supposed to answer them questionnaires. A guy that said living on our street, mama that said, the old man Alexander must have got you because he was a drunkard. He, that man must have went to his box and they sent it back. Now you know when they come after me for a trial behind that way down in them teens, 1950s. I think 50, 51 or 50, no, it's 52. Yeah, 1950 because I'm, uh, I done remarried again. See, I married once when I was young in my teens, but I've been married in 1951. So they go on, they said date for trial, now that didn't come up till fifty four. I'm working at the bank then, pulled in the bank. And trial date. <laughs> I go out there to trial, I won't know. But we're gonna we'll put what that to put on you? You know, when you don't answer to them you try when you supposed to answer, you call. Oh, Oh, what do you call it? Dodge, draft dodger. That's it. That's the draft dodger and all that. Shit. Well, I didn't worry about none of that. Mm -mm. I didn't even worry about none of it when they're going to have to try. Because I'd already done studied and figured out my own stuff about it. I said, that's me with him. Huh. Well, I have. And that, that would come up in the trial. I didn't have lived in that white folk. I'm poor because <laughs> yeah. And I didn't know damn thing didn't, but to do but try to help my country. <laughs> country. Yeah, I don't know that. And I said, I thought I was doing just as good. I get in there to help fighting the wall. <laughs> he told me that shit. And you wouldn't, I said, lied by the I said, that's still gold. I'm still trying to help my United States fighting the wall. And he said, and I said, now look here, y'all done went to school and went to colleges and went to universities. 
And you got sense enough to know if the man is trying to help, is he helping help you all too? Why are you gonna try to send him somebody draft dodge? Not then, not just another thing. How can I be a draft dodger? I'm living where I live when I was inducted and and driving the same job when I was inducted. And born raised that all my life, I'm gonna be a, and he helped me out of that, and I'm gonna be a draft dodger. He looked at me and laughed. He said, well, hell, I'll tell you what. You gonna get out of here. Now, wait a minute. First, I done, <clears throat> when they picked me, they picked me up for that. Read me one night. Come on, I got one night. Kept me in jail here about three days and night, and then sent me to Cambodia, over there. Keep moving, fool. By what? Keep moving there. Phantom. Camp Travis. <laughs> they were Camp Travis. By two, three weeks, they me to Ottawa, Oklahoma, to another hospital. Don't know some mad in the throat, neck, and all that. I don't know what. Well, I stayed there about a week. Then they sent me to Hyde, Illinois, in Chicago. <laughs> Chicago, I stayed there for months, though and took all kinds of shots, final shots and all that. And finally one time, which you look what happened. I said, uh, uh, sat around there with them boys and talking, and he had regular head cut. Hey, Jack, no more. Yes, sir. Getting ready to see you home. I said, okay, sir. Get your things ready. And I was getting ready that day, and well, that next morning I done got up and had my robe on and just walking through the hall looking and got on all these guys was sitting in the door and playing piano. Then I, and I stayed right there, leaning up against the door, listening to that. And so finally, when he did quit, I said, can I play a piece on that piece? He said, yeah, let me shout, just like that. And I played on that piano. And so, when I played, I, I just played, I don't know what I was playing, like right now, I don't, like I, I don't know what I'm my fingers no, I don't know what I'm doing. So, regularly when I go back down to my room, here come a foreign language fella, we're looking for Edna Sanford Boy. And they say, hey, Edna Sanford Boy, he said, that's his bed. And I say, oh yeah, that's me. And he said, they sent it you this money. Man, they sent me five silver dollars and six or seven brand new dollars in greenback. And said, the one you stay here tonight, you play. You play, you stay here tonight, you play. I ought to leave that night. They kept me there that night playing three piano. <laughs> yeah, and that next morning they gave me overcoat, suit of clothes, shoes, and all that. <clears throat> and left there, so. I got my thing, and they they had an army truck which brought me from 21 miles out at Hines, Illinois, that's why that was, in the Chicago train station. And I catch the train out of that that night. And I got in the St. Louis, where he transferred to come in that. And I wasn't supposed to, the train, I was supposed to catch the owl. No, take the special. And so I, Instead of me doing that, I'm going to hang on and try to get in on that aisle. <laughs> First one day, and, they didn't, and you think they didn't get by? Look like, I don't know, a half a mile. Well, I couldn't quite that because I could walk back. My suitcase thing, they put me off. They said, you ain't supposed to ride this train. She didn't pull that thing, put, him, put me off. And I had to go back to the station and wait to <laughs> the train. I was supposed to get off. And I got in the down there, everything was all right. Well then, no, now, after I was getting my thing ready that morning to leave, and they gave me some money and all that, <clears throat> that doctor was examining me on the leave, you know. He said, yeah, he said, this is you, Bill. Most of them people are foreign folk. And I said, hey, I said, what? He said, this is your bill. I said, hmm, my bill. Yeah, you bill, you pay this, hundred and seventeen dollars. I said, that gonna about do. <laughs> I told them, I'm gonna pay it. You see, <laughs> I didn't tell them to see me. <laughs> oh, no. So they thought all that out. <laughs>
No, I didn't have to pay that because I told them I didn't, I was young, I, didn't, I wasn't no college collegiate and university cat and all that. I was just trying to, I knew, have one thing in mind. I didn't want to go to the wall or going to it. But they said, you didn't know how serious it was. I was not one thing about that. <laughs> I was just going. <laughs> yeah, like one time I got on the hobo. Was going, ain't never been on none in my life. I'm going to freight. I suppose was, was going to what's called harvest time in Kansas City. <laughs> I did. I was going to say, I've been around all my life. Sometimes I don't know how we live. I used to play these joints all night, work all day, and beat them joints. And my record to tell you that. When I wrote a song about I want to love my marriage. Yeah. And in that song, I work, do my work, and, and uh, me and her go have great good times at night, work all night, and, and this morning, Go around to the job just the same, work all day the same day. And I'll tell you what I done once. Like I was telling way back when I was talking about, I got traveling one time. I think I was in around 23 or 22. Wasn't doing nothing. Got regular like a tramp. And one Sunday, I was on the park and people all on that park. I said to myself, now this is Look at me, just like an old tramp. I'm going to go, and you know what I've done? That's a little lie. I'll tell people like I tell you, I don't really tell a lie about it. I went in them Trinity River Bottom Woods. <laughs> I was staying all that evening. I said, when the Lord ate me, when Monday morning come, I'm going to get me a job and go to work and clean myself, and I did. And from then on, I was driving them driving gravel trucks, mule trucks. You was driving had a strong gravel pit, West Dallas gravel pit, Charlie Dodd and all them new and team. I'm six, I was 16, 17. See, from that 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, long up to that, man, when my nerve motto of mine is, I was born strong, young, wild, and wise. <laughs> That's right, you hear that little little picture of many, many times. Like I say, I'll be telling the ladies land is there and get the call on that you know, like I was telling them this day when I was playing the thing. I said, What in the uproar? And they chase her. I say, take the Democrat cat to catch a Republican rat. They <laughs> say this is that fool. <laughs> And the hell was you know, I said one thing I know about it, and that is I'm making up a ride. <laughs> I ain't no way to keep it. It was just in me there, that it was all fun to me. I love to play. And I love to tell you, I love to play. Like when I was over on that thing there. Man, I told Miss Miss Diane Hill, I just didn't get to play. Everything all right? No, everything ain't all right. One thing she was, I just didn't get to play enough. <laughs> no, I didn't get to play enough. So when I used to play at Mother Blues Club, I played from 10 to 2 a.m. 2 o'clock, man, I was just getting ready. Well, I used to I play at the piano, man, when I was playing regular all the time. Just a lot no done, well, I was just playing over my head. Without him, I don't play too much. I always used to work after 47 years old. See, that was 19. But see, my boss man died there in 79, and I didn't know it. His wife, and I mean, that she was playing at the Southern Steakhouse, 3817 Lemon Avenue, in 1947, washing dishes, getting $21 a week. For Walter E. Wilden, I went to work at 12 o'clock, but 11.30 every day, I was in Tyson Piano Company on Oak Lawn and Lemon, and fooled around on them pianos. So one day, Mr. Tyson said, Eric, you work around here somewhere? I said, yes, I work over at Walter Wilden Piano Store. He said, sure enough, I know Walter. 
Only let him put a piano in there and you play it. I said to myself, oh, no, that's not that's a... So after all, he jumps in there and one next day so he, he comes to me and says, Damn it, you tell me you play the piano. He watching, see I'm watching this head with a sink right there while he washed his hands out of me. He washed his hands. And it's 12 o'clock then, you know, I'm working. You have me talking to you? They tell me you play the piano or something. I said, yeah, I play a little bit. Just like that, bitch washing my dish. Then, uh, then again, uh, when he get away from me, I said, shit, play with me, you know. But <laughs> yeah, I've been playing through my, he's me, you know. So he said, I'll tell you what, tomorrow I'm going to take an audition. I said, okay. So we go over there. He didn't go that next day. He went the next day, Thursday, because, but them, Hot girls, you know, work on the curd, sort of wild and all that. Then we hamburgers and, and serve you in your car. This three white girl. So I don't know why they got me. But anyhow, when I got there, but all three of them, two on each arm, one pushing in the back. They go, you know, we're going to have you play that piano today. We're going to drag you over. <laughs> so I said, oh, okay, we're going to play it. So I went over there. Played on Well, that next day, he showed up. Mr. Weldon went. He went on that. And so he goes in there and lies this piano, not piano on this place, you know, when they know And so he said, hey, play on this one. I played on that. Hey, play on this one. I played on that. So but finally he goes on the desk, sitting down, just like Mr. He was a tiger, and he take a seat here, so they talked a few minutes. And so, finally he gets up and comes to me. Say, hey, pick out a piano. <coughs> pick out a piano. I look around there and I have got to think about that old second hand world. Is. <laughs> like I tell him, hell, he put in my man. He said, pick you out a piano. I could have picked out a million dollar piano. He got in there I want. But I've been playing on that. Well, and that baby sound good and big and it's a and, and fast action on now, I ain't no jazz piano, I just do it blues and jungle you know, like I said a lot of times. Up to the I'll go play some of this jungle these people. So when they come over there, the that of them all know, I can't get a brand new piano. I said, This is a good piano. And so when I put that piano and got it over there and played it and set it up. And he, he, he propositioned me out there that. See, I'm, I'm supposed to walk around, draw my $21 week till the place to the place through line just there. But it wasn't long, did that? Because that man put on our bed to look like 40, 40 laborers, cobblers and things, and put that line in up that man, it was a pretty place. That gold fish bowls all the way around it. And then you come in behind the counter, two great big gold big bowls sitting like that. And them people sit like you around that bar, drink that beer and stuff, and look and watch them fish. And Mr. Wilson had an old ugly fish in that big old goggle eyes come and call me. He said, Eric, all right. He said, Eric, all right. I said, that's him right there. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> call that old big goggle eyes fish me. So I played on that. He said, now I tell you what, you keep up with your tips, and if you don't make $30 a week tips, I'm going to make it good myself. I'm going to draw my 21 a week right on. Well, I didn't pay that no mind. I, I ain't scared about none of that, because I made, b begin making good tips. And back down there in 1947, I played that down there, be money all on the floor, all on the piano, and had a kitty too. And so I could go downstairs and eat lunch, take dinner, and I was living on shrimp cocktail. <laughs> I sure love this shrimp cocktail. <laughs> of course, he could really fix that shrimp cocktail. He makes that himself. So uh, when I got, now listen, I done played about three months. Right three months ago, one night, the white girl said to me, she waitress, you know. Hey, I said, what? What you doing tonight? 
I said, I don't know. She said, I need $30 a chip tonight. $30 a chip. <laughs> so, now, I told her, I ain't never counted no chip. I said, well, I'm going to count them. Now, all along through that, he would ask me a lot of times, hey, what did you do last night? I said, I don't know. And he was a good man. He was a good He smoked a little chalk. He thought all the time. He said, you old devil, you. <laughs> and when I tell him, I don't know what I'm saying, I don't know that. But on the same time, every Sunday morning, he'd give me a $20 bill. Yeah, every Sunday morning, he'd give me that $20, regardless about keeping up and nothing. He just, every Sunday morning, he'd give me a $20 bill. Well, so, when I told that girl, I ain't never kind of tell I said, I believe I can't mind. I, can't, I mean, kind of what I got in my pocket, too. You might be. And so, I kind of had $30. I said, me and you tied. <laughs> me and you tied. I had $30 out of my pocket. And from then on, he quit longer than me by the tip because, man, I made high out of $65 a night. And I kept on it. Plus my $20 every Sunday morning. I don't worry about nothing. And that's the way it went on. So finally, from 1947 up to 1951, that's when I was, I'm mad right after this conclusion at the Southern Steakhouse, 3817 Lemon Avenue. That same place is running right now, but it's Jamie's. Jamie's place. And I was in there about three months ago and got in there to see if it looked like it did when I used to play there. And so, when I come out of there, I told him, well, this was my old satisfied place where I used to work. So when he had the domestic troubles, he got rid of the Southern State House <coughs> and went on into Houston, which he ran the Twin W Motels on Gulf Freeway, Alameda, and Ganoa Street in Houston, Texas. I guess his wife probably still got it. And he passed in 1979. But now let me back to this part. I didn't know nothing about what Mr. Weldon, and he didn't know my address. That's in 1959 now, when he found out that, that he sent for me in 1959. Think of that, how long that was. From 19, from 47, I mean from 51, up to 1949, well, about eight, nine years. So he sent me to come down there. He done opened up the, I wrote that uh, name down, let me see. Uh, Salmon, Salmon Steakhouse. But anyway, I don't know where it was. 4902 Richmond Avenue, Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. And I got in there that night and he lived in a uh, room on Barby and Dowling Street. I told him. There's a great big flat right on the corner, a colored lady on that place, two sisters. And they were so nice to me because them women come there in the morning and make up that bed. I kind of, they bring me food. I was 59 years old then. You know, that's when my boy was born, my son, was in that marine there, Eliana H. Moore, Jr. He born in 1959, April 18th. Uh -huh. And he writes me now, and I'll get them letters every time he writes me right now. You think he writes this, sweetheart? <laughs> I write that, I love you. So, so what's about the musician? Hmm? What's about the other musician when you started playing piano? For example, Bill Day? Texas Bill, Bill Day. Day? That guy, he used to live in, live in Elm Thicket. No, I don't know about them. Like I tell you, see, that guy stayed in Elm Thicket. He was a living guy. Me and him didn't ever get too much acquainted. Like I'm telling you now, Dallas had hundreds of musicians. I got, I was writing, like, that right now, I got, I got me another, let's see. Now, little Georgia, I spent thousands of dollars, man. All I got is getting books, <laughs> writing. 
And I do. My heart is right all the time. I ain't got it down there. But that's that when my son was born, I did. I try to keep a lot of track of things. That's the reason I buy so much children and stuff. But just seven years ago, the like now, you get, uh, that get boy that I say, Aubrey Allen. He was a piano player. His sister, Frankie Allen. He was a piano player. He had a brother, a nephew named Emmett Allen. He played piano. You don't write it bad, you good. Now you take Frank Leach. And uh, Sam Harris. And you take Buster, because Buster play everything. That Buster Smith, I'm going to tell you what I told you while I go. He's a writer, composer, and sax, and flute. His bus, his brother Hosey, drummer, and his brother Ted, piano, his brother uh, Boston, he played piano, and, and you take now Tex Parker. All them guys right here that he takes Parker. He piano player. And you take uh well I never did Brian, but they said T Bone could play something, but I don't know. He was you see I was kinda of letting the guy know here lately but I mean a lot of them they don't realize. I don't care if you play saxophone, drum, harmonica, flute and all that. It's one, only one of them that you, you can play them all, but it's one of them you master, or sound like me. I mean, you go to town right now to the Baldwin Piano Company, Mr., he got a book, Mr., Mr. Wiley, uh, on that company. One day I was in there, he called, Ellie, come here, I said, what is it? I'm going to show you something I bet you done forgot. He got a book on me when I played, 25 years old, I'm drawing harmonica, O-W-R. I said, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah, you sure you kidding? I sure had done for God that much, do I? He said, yeah, and he even know me for years, a long time. And when he got there, and I tried my best to get this book, he would never let me have it. He said, well, Eric Moore, go on harmonica, O-W-R, 1925. Yeah, man. I could go on down there. And, and uh, Jess Malone and Leroy Malone, them you did, Leroy Malone, M-O-L-O-N-E-Y. Je Leroy Malone and Jesse Malone. He, uh, they both on the piano. And now with Lovett Bookman, he was a gal queen. Bookman. And uh, Mary Wright. And Pluck, we call her Pluck, but her name was uh, Lily Bell. L I L I E B E L L. Lily Bell. And then you take uh, Bubba Miles. Well, let's call him Bubba Miles. And you take uh, uh, Joe Curtis. That's he had a, a nephew, Fred Curtis, they all played it, Luther Smith, and uh, Bob, one-eyed Bob, I call him, now he was a writer and a ranger, and that like Buster, that Buster was, he also, he Buster go for New York and played in a range for them band, he was a ranger. I talked to him a while ago, he lived at 22-something uh, Garden Drive, that's that side, that. And you take Sammy Price, T.B. Wardell, <coughs> and uh, T. 
Charles Dunn, Doug Finnell. Now, Doug Finnell, I'll put him on that because he played pretty good, but he really a, a trumpeter. He played trumpet. Yeah. And and uh, Jack, Jack Ayers, he's a bomber, but he played piano. Dr. Harden, he's piano. He played piano, but he's a doctor. You know, them get like that. Norris McHenry, he's the one who to, went to Chicago with me. He's, me and him met one night. I'm playing piano on Fuquay, which that street in these days up now, from back to 29, it changed to, to, to Locum Street. And so, uh, Somebody brought him while I was playing and introducing to me. And he stood there while I was a blind cat. And so he said, when I was playing, he said to me, he said, Eric, can I sing one number with you? I said, sure. I said, next time I play, that's when I play. You know what I'm saying? But let me tell you something. You know how I used to get a, like, there was no getting no kick, but it used to take up the devil out of me. Back down in them days, and thirty when I used to be playing them guys all be gang around <laughs> I'll be playing it and I knock his head up the man ain't no use to turn around that in that damn head you know he played you damn any different I'd all in my dumb kick a kick a out of me and I'll be